My name is Dr Jennifer Henry and I'm an alum of the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. It's my great pleasure to be joining Dr Rachel Carey, lecturer in food systems in the School of Agriculture and Food at the University of Melbourne in her beautiful food producing garden. Rachel leads the Food Print Melbourne Research Project that looks at how we can build the resilience of Melbourne's food production system to increase equitable access to fresh food for all and reduce our dependence on distant sources of food. It's incredibly important work. Rachel, tell me more about Food Print Melbourne. Well, the Food Print Melbourne project began in 2015 and it's funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And the idea of the project was to produce an evidence base about the food producing region on the fringe of the city that we call Melbourne's Food Bowl. By that, I just mean the farmland on the city fringe. At that point, we were losing quite a lot of farmland. Of course, Melbourne's been sprawling outwards and with new housing estates, we were losing a significant amount of farmland and we were really concerned about that. We wanted to provide an evidence base for policymakers to preserve this area of fresh food production for, for the future. Um, and so we put together this project, which has a range of different stakeholders on the project, um, including the City of Melbourne and the other local governments on Melbourne's fringe as well. But essentially, it's really been about providing this evidence base to help policymakers act to protect that area so we all have fresh food into the future. Terrific. So what are the characteristics of Melbourne's food bowl? Well, we're incredibly blessed um, where we live in Melbourne to, for the city to be in this incredibly productive um, food bowl area. So Melbourne's food bowl um, produces a very wide variety of food, lots of diverse foods. So um, everything from fruit and vegetables through to eggs um, and chicken meat and some, some dairy um, and meat as well. But really it's highly perishable foods and highly perishable foods have always grown close to cities and that's from the time when it was quite difficult to feed a city and really you grew food um, within walking distance of the city. So cities grow highly perishable foods close to them. And we're very lucky that we still have enough food growing around Melbourne to meet around 40% of Greater Melbourne's food needs. And almost half of the vegetables that are grown in the state actually grow on the fringe of Melbourne. And um, quite a high proportion of some types of highly perishable vegetables. So over 60% of lettuce grows on Melbourne's fringe, um, over 90% of herbs, over 90% of cauliflower, and over 90% of the berries that grow in the state also grow in Melbourne's food bowl. So that area um, on the fringe of Melbourne delivers about $2.45 billion worth of economic value to the state and around 21,000 full-time equivalent jobs as well. So it's very important. So what are some of the areas that we're talking about on the fringes of Melbourne? So some of the areas might be ones that people know fairly well. So that would be places like the Mornington Peninsula, um, which grows a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, also places like the Yarra Valley that people might have been out to as well. So for instance, the Yarra Valley grows quite a large proportion of, of the state's strawberries, mm. as an example. That's why I see um, Coldstream written on my strawberry packets. That's right, okay. exactly, that's why you do. And then places like the Mornington Peninsula is really important for growing things like lettuces and herbs and leafy greens. And then we have places that people may not be, be quite so familiar with, but are really important to, um, to certainly a production of fruit and vegetables around Melbourne. So that'd be places like Werribee, around 30 kilometers out um, to the west of Melbourne. Now, Werribee actually produces 10% of the state's vegetables in that one very small area. And it's incredibly important for growing things like um, broccoli and cauliflower and lettuces. So um, that one area actually produces a large proportion of the state's broccoli and cauliflower crop, as an example. And then we have other places that are important, but again, people might be less familiar with, places like Cardinia and out towards um, Casey as well. So there are some of the areas, Melbourne's food bowl. Essentially, Melbourne's food bowl kind of stretches right around uh, from the Surf Coast Shire, kind of all the way around to sort of Borbore Shire in a, in a couple of... Um, a couple of rings of farmland. So I can see as Melbourne's population expands, the need to protect those areas from development is really important. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, we'd really like to see strong protection for all the farmland left in those areas now. And what's being done to protect the water supply for those food bowl areas? Melbourne's blessed with really quite a good water supply. I'm sure we all know that we have quite good quality water. But one of the things that we were particularly concerned about for the future is to ensure 
that farmers in Melbourne's food bowl had sufficient water because we're in a warming and drying climate. Um, but we are lucky because, of course, cities produce a lot of wastewater and that wastewater can be used to produce food. Melbourne has two water treatment um, plants on the fringe of the city. And we've really been trying to ensure that the fertile farmland close to those water treatment plants was all preserved so that, um, so that farms in, the, in those areas can be producing more food using recycled water in the future. So what are the characteristics of a truly resilient food system? What we want there is that we would like to be getting food from multiple geographic sources. It doesn't make sense to put all your eggs in one basket, if you like, and to be having food coming from one source. It's really important that we have food coming from global sources and from national and state sources, but it's also really important to make sure that we've got some fresh food production on the city fringe. It doesn't make sense to become entirely dependent on more distant sources of foods. So that's one important thing. The other important thing, as was mentioned before, is that cities have a couple of different types of important waste products. One is the water um, that we've talked about earlier, but another important source of waste is just the food waste, the organic waste that we produce in the city. And those two sources of waste can be used to help grow food. So food waste collected at the curbside now in many parts of Melbourne can be processed into compost and that can be used on farms close to the city. And that's really important because the natural resources that underpin conventional fertilizers are declining in supply, as is water because we're in this drying and warming climate. And so we have these great resources that we can use to produce food close to the city to help us counter those sorts of pressures that we're now facing on food supply, particularly from things like climate change, mm. which is coming up it's obviously a much bigger issue into the future. Mm. So you've mentioned climate change and water shortage. What are some of the other shocks and stresses to Melbourne's food supply? Well, climate change could produce a few different types of shocks and stresses to the food supply. So one being that longer term stress of drought, and we've experienced that already through the millennium drought and the more recent drought, um, when just lack of water led to lower production of, of food and it led to rising food prices too from drought. So during the millennium drought from 2005 to 2007, the price of food increased by 12% but the price of fresh vegetables actually went up 33%, so that's quite a lot, and the price of fresh um, fruit by 43% as well. And we've also seen, in fact, from the recent bushfires, another potential shock to the system, but that's led to rising food prices too for some types of fruits and vegetables. So climate change, we get this mix of longer term stresses like drought and also sudden shocks to the system. These sudden events like a bushfire or a flood or a major storm that might cut off transportation into the city as well. And then of course, we've got things like pandemic shock. So I think we've probably all noticed some changes to what we're seeing in the supermarkets as a result of the current situation with COVID-19. So these are all the types of shocks um, that we might face the food system. And then of course, there's just things like population growth in Melbourne too. So this rapidly growing population, which is leading to loss of farmland on the city fringe. That, that's also a stressor to the mm. food supply. Are these shocks and stresses experienced to a similar extent in other cities in Australia? They are, yeah. So if we think about, for instance, during the Brisbane floods in 2010-11, the Brisbane floods led to quite a significant shock to the food supply when Brisbane was cut off um, by water, of course, and the major highway was cut off by water and that led to some significant issues, obviously inundation of farms, the inundation of the wholesale market there, supermarkets were flooded out um, as well, but it was actually very difficult to get food into Brisbane at that point because most food is transported by truck in Australia and because the highway was cut off there as well. So yes, yeah, certainly, you know, all the major cities um, around Australia are all, we're all prone to these types of shocks and stresses and will become more prone in future with climate change. So what can policymakers do to make our locally produced food system more sustainable? Well, one of the things that we could look to is the type of measure that the South Australian government um, took in 2017, where they've introduced environment and food production areas to protect those really important areas of food production on the city fringe. And in fact, the Victorian government is looking at the moment, they're considering doing something similar. So there's a policy process currently underway to look at greater protection for strategic agricultural land on Melbourne's fringe. And 
what we'd really hope to see there is that that exercise um, strengthens protection for all of the farmland that's left on Melbourne's fringe because it's now all really important um, to be protecting that for the future. And how much can state and local governments contribute to this area by preferencing local food producers when they're purchasing food for facilities such as childcare centres and hospitals? Well, there's a lot that could be done there if we think about it. So the state government and in fact local governments as well do need to purchase food for different types of services that they provide. So if we think about local government, we can think about things like Meals on Wheels or childcare centres and we think about state government, then we've got things like hospitals and um, prisons and schools and things as well. Now, what if the food that we bought for those services actually came from our local Victorian farmers? So we're actually preferencing them. And that's something that is done um, in different, different places around the world, in the, in the US or in the UK. You'll find that they have policies to actually preference local farmers or buy a certain portion of food from local farmers. And I think that would be a fantastic idea. Terrific. Much of our audience are from our faculty and they're involved in educating young farmers. So how, how will this help young farmers moving into the industry? Well, we obviously have an ageing farmer population, I think we're all aware of, and it's really important to get young farmers um, into the industry. And there are many young people that would like to begin, but it's particularly difficult to begin farming around Melbourne on the city fringe because of the price of land. So one of the things that we could be doing is looking at different schemes that um, enable young farmers to more easily come into farming. And those can be things like helping them to um, lease land, matching them up with other farmers who are perhaps looking to retire from their farms and finding ways that those younger farmers can you know, come in to farm in Melbourne's food. And there's many younger people that would like to do that, partly because of the direct connection that they have to, to consumers and to businesses as well. They're kind of very innovative young farmers coming into farm in these areas. Looking overseas, what inspiring examples are there that we might look at adopting in Australian policy in future? Mm, there's some really interesting examples overseas. And I think one of the examples of a country that is you know, quite similar to our own in some ways would be Canada. And in Canada, they've done some amazing work in protecting the fringes of cities that are growing rapidly. So particularly around Vancouver and Toronto. So around Vancouver, they have established what they call an agricultural land reserve which protects a very large amount of land um, around Vancouver and protects it permanently, which is really important to have that certainty into the future so that you know for the next 50, 100 years that land is going to be protected to produce food. And then if we look at Toronto, they also have an area around the city that they call the Golden Horseshoe, where a lot of their, um, a lot of their food comes from. And the state government does a really good job there of connecting people directly with that area. So as an example, some of the things they've done around Toronto is they have produced um, a, a label for food that comes from that area. So it's called Greenbelt Fresh, so that when you go shopping, you can actually find and recognise food that comes from the area around your own city. It's marketed in that way. They have also introduced cycling routes and walking routes through the area so that you can take your bike and cycle all around that area. If you go into the Golden Horseshoe area, there are signs everywhere to tell you that you're now entering or now leaving um, the Golden Horseshoe area. So that um, people are just becoming familiar with that area, understanding that it's the area that their food comes from. And what they then find is that public support for attaining that area is very high because people understand just how important it is for their food supply. What a great way to have people take a sense of pride in their local mm. food production system. Absolutely. So what can we as consumers and household food producers do to help support local food producers on the city fringes? There's lots of things that we can do um, ourselves. So one of the most important things is simply to be buying food from local farmers where we can. Of course, that can be difficult because when we go into stores, um, the food isn't necessarily labelled as having come from Victorian farmers or having come from farms on Melbourne's food bowl. But we can seek out, we can try to seek out um, local food through by visiting farmers markets, um, for instance. So we can um, buy directly from the farmer through box schemes where you might be able to buy food directly from Victorian farmers or through community supported agriculture um, schemes perhaps as well. So that's one of the um, 
one of the important things that we can do. Another thing is to eat seasonally. So to eat what's actually um, being produced in Victoria now rather than buying food from further afield. Um, and we can also just, of course, think about growing a bit for ourselves if we can at home, whether we have somewhere where we can grow, you know, grow a few pots of food or if you're lucky enough to have a bit of a backyard as well, then just growing some of our own food helps put us in touch with what it actually takes to grow food and I think enables us um, to understand the whole process better. And another thing is just in the way um, that we use food so we don't waste it, right? We really want to be reducing our food waste currently because food waste um, undermines the whole food system. When we're wasting food, it's not just money, our own money that we're wasting. We're also wasting the natural resources that went into growing that food. So the land, the water, the energy, etc. So if we can reduce our food waste, that's a great thing. And also if we can do things like buy um, fruits and vegetables that are non-standard shapes and sizes. So what tends to happen is that when farmers are selling through to the major retailers, major supermarkets, then they have very strict specifications about what they buy in terms of the appearance and size of the fruit and vegetables. But you can buy the non-standard ones. So if you um, go into some stores, you'll see the kind of odd bunch fruit and vegetables. So if we buy those, then we're supporting farmers to be able to sell the whole crop right, rather than losing a third of their crop. So there's a whole range of different ways that um, we can support farmers just through our own actions. What about the role of what we could grow in our own backyards? Well, for those of us that are lucky enough to have a bit of a backyard, it's actually amazing um, what you can manage to grow with a relatively, you know, relatively short um, block. And we're really lucky here because of the climate. So that means that you can grow all year. So where I am in this area, um, we almost but not quite have a frost-free climate. And that means that, you know, we can really just carry on growing fruit and vegetables all year. And that's one of the most important things about Melbourne's food bowl too, in fact. The fact that we have these long seasons, if you look at a place like Mornington Peninsula, they can put in three, four crops a year. More recently, we found ourselves in a very different situation during lockdown. What difference has that had on the way consumers respond to local food production. Mm, it's been really interesting to see that, of course. I think that for many consumers, the pandemic is the first time they've seen a kind of shock to the food supply that they've been able to actually recognize and see in store, just with not having so many of their perhaps favorite foods on the shelves. And that, of course, is simply the food supply chain catching up because we have a just-in-time supply chain that needs to catch up to this sudden increase in demand. But the other really interesting side of what's been happening is people sort of increasing demand for locally produced food. So people who are running local box schemes have seen an enormous increase in, um, in people's demand and interest for locally produced food. Now, of course, there've been, um, it's been a bit challenging to, for some people to run farmers markets, etc. although we want to keep those going and many of them are still running um, through the city. But Farmers have also been connecting directly with consumers by going online. So huge numbers of farmers are now um, going online through platforms like the Open Food um, Network to, for the first time, have an online store and then to deliver to um, people as well. And then we have kind of restaurants that are, of course, not necessarily operating in the same way anymore, but um, doing still doing takeaway food and who are trying to connect directly with those farmers too. Um, and then we have social enterprises that are emerging, which are trying to um, use, trying to buy food from local farmers to be giving to people in need, people who are vulnerable as well. So we've got the most amazing kind of social enterprise network that is bubbling um, away in Melbourne at the moment, which is really trying to make sure they're still getting locally produced food to people in need. It strikes me that if these recommendations are taken up by the policymakers and by us as consumers, it would have a huge economic benefit in the short and long term. Would you agree? Well, I would. I mean, I think that um, certainly if we were all to increase our demand for locally produced food a bit, that could have quite a significant economic impact. So on the Food Print Melbourne project back in 2016, we had a bit of a look at this and we got Deloitte to do some modelling for us. And that showed that if, um, if we in the Greater Melbourne area were to increase our uh, demand for 
locally produced food by around just 10 percent that could deliver about another um, 290 million um, dollars worth of economic value just from the extra agricultural produce that farmers would would grow so really just changing our behavior in terms of purchasing locally produced food can have quite a significant economic benefit for the state as a whole as well as of course keeping um, the livelihoods of those farmers strong too. Thanks Rachel there's some really helpful tips there that we can all adopt. I'd like to thank you for spending time with me this afternoon and I'm sure you will join me in thanking Rachel for sharing her insights and hosting us in her lovely garden. Thank you and bye for now.